morning, everyone. Wonderful day to be here with you and uh, about to start our worship service. If you're a guest, we're happy to have you with us. Uh, there's a place in the bulletin you can fill out your information, who you are, your phone number, and we'd love to be in contact with you. Uh, two announcements. First one is Parker and Tate's wedding shower will be at 2 p.m. on April 7th, right? I'm going to get Tate cleaned up and get her a bath and all that and get her ready, uh, ready for marriage in May. And then uh, Sunday after Easter, we'll go ahead and announce that we'll have a, a quick business meeting, and it will just be for the purpose of uh, the legality of the uh, uh, voting on the new members at that time. But that's fixing to happen here in just a minute. We've got some people coming before the church that are joining in our faith family, and you will be voting them in. Uh, uh, covenant relationship with us uh, at that moment but we got to do the legal stuff too so it will be a week after Easter uh, I hope you have thought about what we've talked about again and prepared uh, this week last night this morning for what we're about to do and engage in this corporate time of worship this time we all have to come together uh, so let's go to the world in prayer uh, Father we're so thankful for each other and for you bringing us together for your purpose uh, we're also thankful, we're thankful for the faith families uh, around us in this area that uh, desire to, the things that we do, uh, desire to be healthy and biblical, and we ask for them, that your spirit leads them and provides these uh, faith families the wisdom they need to grow and persevere in the faith. Uh, we ask that you grant them the courage they need to stand against the world around them, uh, to conform not to the culture, but as Romans says, uh, 12 says, but uh, to be transformed by the renewal of their minds, to be new creations in Christ. We love them, and uh, uh, Lord, we uh, know your word says that we are new creations in Christ, and we ask for your help to remain faithful and teachable and prayerful and that you provide the discernment that we need to pursue all that is perfect and holy. And we thank you for your grace you have given us through Jesus that uh, even lets us come to communion with you right now. Amen. If you guys don't mind, is my mic on? You hear me good? Okay, all right, good deal. Let me ask the... Um, the new members who the, have gone through the new members course, if you would, to come up at this time. And I'm going to read their names off. And if y'all don't mind, when I read your name off, just throw up your hand. Um, because I know that a lot of you have probably seen them at a distance. Maybe, maybe you're not in the same Sunday school uh, group as they are, a discipleship group, and you, you haven't gotten to know them by name or gotten to know them really well, um, but you will uh, in, in the future. I have no doubt about that. So I'm going to read their names off to you. Um, Dylan Gray, Nate Gray, Josh Coffey, Kelly Coffey, Kaylee Coffey, Zoe Coffey, Taylor Coffey, Glenn McElroy, and Phoebe Jones. Where's Phoebe? Okay. Phoebe, Phoebe might have been helping in the nursery or something. <laughs> okay. I know it. I know it. It's, uh, it's her parents. That's what I, uh. Come on, Phoebe. <laughs> she loves the attention, too. I promise you that. Oh, baby. And Phoebe Jones. So uh, what a great time uh, to be at Mount Zion Baptist Church. Uh, we're growing with, with new babies, uh, uh, young people getting married, um, and, and now new members as well. And so we're, we're really, we've really been blessed um, because we've prayed for God to bring us people that, that he wanted here. Not that we'll attract people by this means or that means, and God has been so faithful uh, to bring us exactly who he wants to be here and, and who we need. 
And so today, uh, I'm just going to go through our affirmation of church membership, which most of you have been through that, witnessed that before. It's five simple questions that we ask to those who are joining our church. We're not going to do it individually because there's a lot of them, so they will answer these questions collectively, and then I'll turn to you, and we'll have uh, affirmation in the form of a question to the faith family as well. So, to the new members, by God's grace, will you commit to demonstrate love to all people, through proclaiming the gospel to the lost, reaching out to minister to your neighbor, and especially by caring for the needs of your fellow church members. By God's grace, will you commit to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you might live a life that is above reproach and is worthy of the gospel. By God's grace, will you commit to esteem the biblical view of marriage and seek to raise your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And by God's grace, will you commit to resolve conflicts biblically, refuse to gossip, and support the practice of loving church discipline? And the final question to you, by God's grace, will you commit to be a faithful steward of your finances and possessions so that the church may fulfill its responsibility to spread the gospel to all people? All right. And church, to you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will you seek to carry out your God-given responsibility to those who are joining our church, exercising mutual care, stimulating growth in grace, holiness, and knowledge. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then you guys can be seated. Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness. Lord, this is a prayer uh, from this church that you have continued to answer. Lord, we've asked that you grow us numerically, but you grow us in your way. And Father, you have um, blessed us in abundance uh, in, in that regard, and we're so thankful. Lord, bless these new families as they join our church and help them to be an encouragement to us and us an encouragement to them. Uh, and I pray, God, that in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead that, that they will serve you and serve this, this faith family in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Good morning. It's great to be gathered together in the presence of our Lord and Savior this morning. I'm going to ask if you would to please stand and join with us this morning as we worship our Lord and Savior together. Felt the nails upon his hands. 
behold our God. Nothing can compare to him. Amen. Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26 says, Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Sing with us this morning, All I Have is Christ. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy of mine had led me to the grave. I had no
stand now and join with us as we sing Christ is mine forevermore.
Good morning, church. Join me this morning in James chapter 5, please. James chapter 5. We're coming to a closer and closer conclusion to finishing the book of James. So again, I, I, I covet your prayers in the next few weeks that God will give us direction uh, where to go from here. James chapter 5, we'll look at verses 13 through 18 this morning and continue this pattern of, of, of suffering. Uh, but James doesn't just mention suffering ad nauseum. He gives us different ways to approach suffering and, and different, even examples. And so I hope that you have been encouraged, uh, even, if, even if you're not in the midst of suffering, uh, what the Word of God has to teach us um, about suffering in general because none of us are exempt from suffering and from trials. And, and so even though it may seem repetitive a lot of times because it's something that James does address a lot through his epistle it is extremely important uh, nonetheless so James chapter 5 verses 13 through 18 uh, the title of this morning's message is the power of prayerful saints the power of prayerful saints now this passage does contain a few verses that that bring about some difficult interpretations so I, I want to mention that from the very beginning that looking at today's text knowing that there may be some different ideas that you've heard about uh, this verse or that verse, and uh, we'll do our best to be faithful not only to the text, but within its context and the rest of James. But prayer is obviously the main theme in this text, but there are other things that we'll ad address here as well. But in the very first verse that we look at today, again, suffering is mentioned, all right? Suffering or trials, uh, whatever you'd like to call it. So we come it seems like we're circling way back around from chapter 1 and just uh, taking uh, probably every single chapter in James addresses suffering or trials in some way or some form or some fashion. But we know as Christians that the only way to overcome trials is to be Christ-centered. And as Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, to have an attitude of prayer, to pray without ceasing. And James is clear that this begins with the individual acknowledging the suffering or the trial that he or she may be going through because it may be private it may be in the privacy of their own life but it never should stay there and even in the, as the text will address today James encourages us not to allow it to stay there at all it extends to the community extends to the church and sometimes we may wonder why why would the Lord want me to bring my baggage my difficult circumstances, the things that I'm going through, and lambast them on somebody else that's not going through anything at that time. Because we need each other. We need each other is the, is the most simple answer. We, we'll, we'll go and give the more biblical answer as we look into this text. But the simple fact is that we need each other, and God knows that. And so God, in his, in his mercy to us, has given us one, of, one another to carry that burden. My prayer is that this text will cause us to see that every single part of our life should be Christ-centered, including how we face these sufferings, these temptations, that we'd be Christ-focused and live amongst Christ's church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and I'd ask you to stand as we, as we read the text, and we'll follow by, by going to the Lord in prayer. Starting there with verse 13, the Bible says, Is there anyone among you suffering let him pray is anyone cheerful let him sing praise is anyone among you sick let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the lord and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins he will be forgiven therefore confess your sin to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. You can be seated as we pray. Father, you're good, you're merciful. God, you're gracious, and we see it in so many ways. Lord, the ways that we are blind to it, I pray that you would open our eyes and help us to see it. 
Help us to always acknowledge your goodness in our life, your goodness in the lives of, of, of our faith family and those that we know and love the most. And God, help us to be representatives of that love. Help us to be ambassadors of your grace and your mercy. Lord, I pray as we look at this text today that you would give us a biblical understanding of what we're looking at. Lord, that you would help us to see the, the purpose of trials and what our response should be. And that God, help us to remove this idea or this mentality from our mind that we should be absent from trials because we know, Lord, that they come to all people. Father, we love you. We ask you just to bless this time through our sermon today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the midst of, of suffering, which is what we've looked at a lot uh, in James for the past few weeks, we've been instructed on how to handle that adversity, how to handle any type of trial or suffering. We've been promised to how it will affect us coming out on the other side. And today, James goes into a little bit different detail or greater detail and talks about how trials drive the believer. How trials will a lot of times push us this way or that way and teach us a lot. Put us in a position, if you would, in how to embrace them. So that's going to be what we uh, begin with today with our first point being the response of trials. And we see that in verse 13. First and foremost, look what he says. Is anyone among you suffering? What does he instruct them to do? Pray. Pray first and foremost. And the word here that he's using for suffering could refer to a number of different types of suffering, whether it be physical or mental or emotional or spiritual. There are a lot of different ways that one could suffer. There's nothing about being a believer that guarantees us or that promises us that we will be absent from suffering. It's part of life for the believer and for the non-believer. But in this statement, we're, if, if, if it were in the form of a question... James might be saying, is prayer the first thing that you do when facing trials? Is prayer the first thing that you do when facing trials? And of course, the default answer for the Christian is what? Yes, yes, of course, that's the first thing I do is I go to the Lord in prayer. But is it really? Because a lot of times we respond, first of all, by complaining to God or by questioning God or by trying to take on whatever suffering or whatever trial we're going through on our own. We can handle it by ourselves. We can handle it in the flesh. Or they make a self-help book at, at uh, Barnes & Noble that I can buy for that. But when a conflict arises at home, do you pray first? Is that the very first thing that you do is you go to the Lord in prayer. You say, God, help me to be an example of godliness in my home. Help me to be an example of patience in my home. Lord, give me wisdom uh, how to respond because I know that my spouse is watching how I respond. I know how that my children are watching me and seeing how I respond. What about when somebody makes you angry at work? No, that like it doesn't happen. It happens every day, right? But when somebody makes you angry at work, do you pray first? Do you first say, God, please help me? Help me to know how to respond. Help me to be the hands and feet of Jesus while I'm here. You've got me here for a reason. This is not by accident that I work at company A, B, or C. And even in the things of life that you may consider not major, the things of life that you may consider mundane and just everyday occurrences, you, you've got a car that breaks down. Do you pray about those small things? Do you pray, God, help me to find a mechanic that knows what they're doing. Help me to find a mechanic that's going to treat me right and not rip me off. And, and yes, and then, then we all collectively take our cars to affordable automotive, right? You're welcome, brother. So <laughs> I say all that to say this. Life is going to bring us problems. There's going to be suffering. And, and I feel kind of strange throwing out examples because a lot of our examples compared to what the church in Jerusalem was going through really pale in comparison, right? If we're honest, we've got it made most of the time. But when those trials, when those sufferings do come at us, how are we responding? Do we even stop and think about it, pray about it, concern how we might respond in that time of adversity for us, realizing that God has allowed these things to take place in my life. They're not just something that shocks Him. 
And if they're allowed in the life of a believer, they're there for a purpose. They're there to strengthen us. They're there for us to become more and more dependent and reliant upon Him. Do we realize that prayer is essential? It's essential. It's not just a a good form of addressing suffering, addressing trials, addressing issues in the life of a believer. It is essential. And it is what we should turn to first and foremost. Why? Because there is no one that can bring comfort to our weary souls like our perfect Savior. No one can bring us the comfort that Christ provides. Listen how the Apostle Paul describes that comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, And the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. Why? Listen. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. With the comfort with which ourselves are comforted by. So your affliction, whether it may be something that you have dealt with for the first time, those seem to be the most difficult ones. I've never run into this problem before. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to act or respond. Those things are strengthening your walk with the Lord. And if you've gone through something, I know I said this repetitively because it's just something that comes to my mind when the text is discussing trials or sufferings. Those things that you have been through in your life are not for you to just try to do your best to get over them and move on. Those are things that God wants you to use from here on out to minister to the lives of others. And I don't think it can be said enough. And I think that's a beautiful thing about Mount Zion Baptist Church. I'm amazed at how I see others. And a lot of times I don't even know anything about it. And I'll hear somebody share something personal with me weeks, months, years on down the road. And, and, and I had no idea that somebody else from our faith family had ministered to them in a way that I couldn't. Because I haven't been through that specific trial. But somebody that had used that as an opportunity to make much of Jesus in the life of that person that was hurting. So the sufferings you go through, church, the trials that you go through, don't waste them. Don't waste them as an opportunity to be able to minister into the life of somebody else. You know, let this be the comfort that that we seek being prayer. Let that be the thing that we seek first and foremost is turning to God in prayer. And it's sad that we have to constantly have that reminder to go to the Lord in prayer because it's a practice that we should be, should be part of our lives every single day, whether we're in the midst of a trial or not. It should be that we go to the Lord in prayer with everything. But the honest problem, if we really want to look at it, is pride. We struggle with pride. And pride a lot of times causes us to want to take things on our own. We don't want anybody else in our business. We don't want anybody, we don't want to bother anybody else. Scripture is clear that it is not a burden to bear one another's burdens. We'll exhaust every effort to fix our issues. And at last resort, a lot of times we cry out, Lord, bless what I'm trying to do. Bless my efforts. Bless my uh, attempt to take on all of these things in my life. And, And the Lord, through his word, is crying out to us. Confess that to another brother or sister in Christ. Confess that to me. I am strong where you are weak. He wants us to be totally reliant upon him. As one commentator said, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you shouldn't do anything until you've prayed. You can do, any, you can do a lot of other things after you've prayed. We, we know that to be true, but there's nothing that we should do before we first take it to Jesus. When, when prayer is first, it tells ourselves and it tells the world who we are totally dependent upon, who we are totally relying upon, and without him, let's just confess today that we would surely fail. We would surely fail. We sing a hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and there's a line in that song that is so rich in truth, and while at the same time it it confronts our weakness, it confronts our frailty, it confronts our inconsistent uh, prayer life, That line is, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. 
all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Not only is that true just for our ears to hear, that is so biblical, that is so scriptural, and that's why some of the old hymns are just so sweet uh, to sing and to listen to. An early church historian by the name of Eusebius said this about James. He said that his knees grew hard like a camel's because of his constant worship of God, kneeling and asking forgiveness for the people. So we look just a little bit in the future from the time that James was written, and somebody that knew James was saying this about him. And, and, and I think Eusebius would say, for James to be telling you and I, to do this to, in, tri, in, the, in the midst of trials, to do this in the midst of suffering, listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. He's not just somebody that says, uh, do as I say, not as I do. He was an example of what he was encouraging and challenging the church to do. So James, the calluses on his knees, testified to the seriousness of his prayer life. And that got me to thinking, I thought, and I couldn't help but wonder, is there anything that testifies of the seriousness of any kind of spiritual discipline in my own life. In other words, if there was a book that was written about me after I passed away, what would that book contain? What would that book say about me? Well, Josh liked to hunt, and Josh liked to fish, and Josh liked to do this or, or do that. That's great, and that's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with those things, nothing wrong with your hobbies and your interests. But what would it say about me spiritually? Would the author have a chapter? Would the author have multiple chapters? Or would he have just one vague paragraph about my life from a spiritual standpoint? Because that's the only thing in eternity that is going to matter, that's going to last. But James doesn't stop with that exhortation for us to stop and first and foremost pray. He ex extends that exhortation when responding in trials by saying, another thing that we must do as Christians is sing. Is sing. If you maintain a cheerful attitude, even in the midst of your trial, or if God brings you through that trial, regardless, sing. What does singing insinuate about our lives? It insinuates happiness. It insinuates joyful. The word for cheerful in this passage in the Greek is euthymeo, which describes somebody that has a positive attitude. And their positive attitude is not indicative on what's going on in their life at the time. It's not somebody who is talking about somebody that's physically well, but somebody who is happy. They're joyful despite their trials, despite whether things are going great or the way that they wanted to. And the picture in this text is of someone who is crying out to God for help, and the other is those who are singing praise for being delivered out of that trial. And they go hand in hand, pray, sing. Scripture would suggest that, that prayer and praise are very closely related. And Colossians 4 says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. You know, it may seem like it only makes sense to sing when we're happy. Because a lot of times we sing what? When we're happy. It just, you know, you've had a great week at work or Friday is, is here and the work week's over, you're heading home, the weather's nice outside, you roll that window down, and what's the first thing you want to do? Not sit in silence, not listen to your tires, wah, 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 wah. You want to sing, even if you can't sing. You're there by yourself, nobody but you and the Lord, you're going to sing. But it doesn't make sense a lot of times to sing when you're in the midst of despair, when there's suffering going on in your life. But let me, let me encourage you. If you've never sang, in a time in your life where you're suffering, when you're going through something that you never imagined would happen, do it anyway. There is something that is so therapeutic to the soul about singing in the midst of despair. And I really didn't understand that until probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. I'm not good with time. Casting Crowns came out with a song, I'll Praise You in This Storm. And I don't know the purpose behind that song. I never have. But just listening to the words and singing along with it in times of despair in my life, in times in my life where I just, things just weren't going my way, brought joy to my soul. 
God, I'll praise you in this storm. And it doesn't make sense, really. Because it's completely contrary to what the world does. It's completely contrary to what really our flesh wants to do. How much easier is it to go through suffering and pain and and trials of life and just get off work and go to a bar and get hammered? It'd be so much easier to handle things the way that the world expects us to handle things. But when you can praise God in the midst of the storm, when you can praise God in the midst of the tragedy, it will minister sweetly to your soul. And listen to me, there's no such thing as a time when Jesus doesn't want praise from us. And we know that Jesus wants praise from us. His word tells us to. We're exhorted from Genesis to Revelation to praise him, to sing to him, to use instruments to glorify his name, to glorify him through our bodies, through our words, every way imaginable. And that includes singing. To some of you that may not like to sing or may not think that you're good at singing, sing to him in private. He is worthy. When you're looking at good, doctrinally rich songs to add to your playlist, make sure that you include that list of old hymns. Old hymns of the faith that have carried and comforted the church for years. And yes, there's a difference between songs that are are, are sound and songs that are not. Everything that carries the name Christian is not a Christian song, okay? So if you need help, maybe you're like, hey, I don't really have a Christian playlist. Could you point me in the right direction? Come see me. I'd love to. Go to Mark. Mark's probably got more knowledge uh, than anyone in our church about, you know, who to listen to. But there are some, there are some just groups or individuals that you just listen to their song and it's just different. It just hits different. Because it's saturated with scripture. But singing praise will help you to fight through the adversities of life. John Piper likes to say, when you're down, you've got to fight for joy. Those of you that have experienced some deep, deep suffering and some deep, deep trials, that phrase makes sense to you. You're thinking right now of times in your life where you did. You had to fight for joy because it didn't make sense. You had to fight for joy because your flesh didn't want to. You had to fight for joy because you were flat on your face in the midst of a trial. And you didn't know which way to turn. And if you did fight for joy, be an encouragement to someone else. Train someone else in how to fight for joy. And two ways to do that is to pray and to sing your way out of it. So we have two beautiful responses that James gives us initially right off the bat in response to trials. But we also have the importance of point number two, community during trials. Community during trials. And he mentions that in verses 14 through 16. When we have a biblical view of suffering, and and, and there shouldn't be any other view that we have. I, I hope that you don't have a worldview of suffering. But when you have a biblical worldview of suffering, we see that God has never Ever, not one time, listen to me, proud people, God has never meant for you to suffer in isolation. Ever. You're not on an island. God didn't create us to be that way. Listen, I I have said a hundred times I'd love to buy a thousand acres, sit a house out in the middle of it, and just ignore the world and watch it pass away. And I understand why I feel that way. And I understand if some of you feel that way sometimes. But it's not biblical. It's not a biblical mindset. The battle of trials, though, begins by the believer, first and foremost, going to God. But it does not stay there. And I'm going to read Galatians 6 too, because we've read it ad nauseum as we went through James. But it bears repeating over and over again. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But listen to me, the only way that that can be done is to tell one another. It's to share with one another. It's to be open with one another, confess to one another. So James encourages them. He says, first, call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. All right, now listen, this is kind of the part that I mentioned earlier where there's some different opinions in Bible interpretation in this this context. But don't get get wrapped up in all of that, okay? Uh, This is not anything that we need to be all legalistic about. Let me say this, though. They're, they're faithful brothers uh, like John MacArthur and Douglas Moo. 
who would suggest that this passage, when it's talking about suffering, is, is not dealing with physical healing. They believe that it's talking about specifically spiritual healing, spiritual suffering, whether it be sin or something like that in somebody's life. The word sick is astheneo, all right? It's found 18 times in the New Testament, and and that's critical. 14 of those times is referring to spiritual weakness. So this is, we can see why these brothers would, would, would lean this way. And when you look on further into uh, verse 15, the argument seems to make more sense because of the latter part of that verse where it says, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, here's what James is not necessarily suggesting. James is not suggesting that sickness is always an occurrence of sin. Well, you're sick, so that must mean you're living in sin. No, that's not the case. James would have been very familiar with Jesus' words in John 9 when Jesus was asked if a man's blindness was due to the fact of his sin or his parents' sin. And Jesus says, no, 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 neither one. It was not this man that sinned or his parents. That's not the reason that he's blind. He's blind because sin, yes, in general, because of the fall of man, has resulted in a a plethora of awful things. Job was in a similar situation as well. But there are passages that do seem to indicate that sin is associated with sickness or death. When we partake in the Lord's Supper here, every time we read the passage, 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 30, and I'll refresh your memory. It says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person therefore examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. So when considered this way, sickness could be seen as a means of grace. I think sickness, I think trials oftentimes are a means of grace or a way for God to say, I'm not going to strike you dead, but I do want you to wake up. I do want you to pay attention. I've wanted you to be sanctified for this many months or for this many years, and you seem to be just content and lax in everything you do. So this has been allowed in your life. Now is a good time to wake up. Now is a good time to see the light. But most translators believe that this text is referring to physical healing. But even if that's what's being taught, there's got to be an understanding that this is ultimately God who heals and not man. This is not any strength of man. There's not a man who's ever walked the earth that is capable of this name it and claim it, you be healed, you be healed, you be healed. If so, they need to be in the children's hospital right now. Right now. Why are they not there? Whether this person is spiritually sick or physically sick, the presence of the elders should bring comfort. It should bring encouragement. These are men who should know the Word of God and should be able to minister to their flock, should be able to minister to the people who are going through some type of suffering and do that directly from the Scriptures. If I've got anything to tell you above and beyond what the Word of God says, I'm I'm just gibbering. It's of no value to you. But in the vernacular of the New Testament, when the sheep are broken and hurting and sick, They need the shepherds who will intercede on their behalf for God to heal them, for God to renew them. And let me add a little side note to that as to how it should be addressed here at Mount Zion. Your your pastors, we are not omniscient, okay? We're not omniscient. Uh, We are made in the image of God, but I promise you there are a lot of ways that um, he is way, way more highly than we are. We do spend time praying for our flock each week. We do spend time praying for you individually as you're sick or if you're having a baby or a young couple about to get married or whatever uh, that prayer need is. And we're always available to you. Listen to me. You are not a burden to your pastors. We love you. We love you. We, we pray that God would help us to love you better because we know that we're even, we're even 
you know, less able to love you than what we want to. So we ask God to help us to grow in that area. It's a great blessing. It's a great honor to go before God on your behalf. But whether your sickness or your suffering is directly related to sin in your life, we don't know. We don't know that. But even if it isn't, even if it's not, even if you have some type of suffering or sickness in your life and you're you're, you're convinced that it has nothing to do with any ongoing sin in your life. What a great time to have some self-reflection and say, God, I don't know if there's anything specific that has caused this sickness, but if there is, Lord, bring it to my attention. I want to confess of it. I want to repent of it and teach me through this trial. Teach me through this suffering. It's never a bad time to ask the Lord to search us and to reveal any grievous way that might be within us. But what about the oil? Here we go. Well, this is a fun one, all right? And, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not diving off into this too deep, okay? What about the oil? Well, there, this has been another interpretive nightmare for a lot of Bible scholars. Uh, and the oil for many has been so significant. But there was oil used in the Old Testament. There was different types of oil used for different types of reasons, maybe for uh, medicinal purposes or sacramental purposes. But I don't believe that's the case here indicated in this text. It's also not a means of divine power, okay? If you go to the Christian bookstore and you buy some oil or some holy water, for that matter, they sell that too, um, there's nothing divine about it, right? You might as well just use motor oil and tap water, okay? There's nothing divine about that. But most scholars believe that this oil is simply symbolic. And I want to help you to understand, anointing with oil was usually used to consecrate or, or set someone apart for a particular service or a particular ministry. So the symbol here would be of the Holy Spirit setting the suffering person apart, setting them apart to be ministered to by the elders, and that was just a symbolic instrument of comfort. I don't want to minimize the oil or, or make anybody uh, feel weird about what they might have thought the oil was to, to be used for, but it's abundantly clear that regardless of what we think about this text, that the main focus in this passage is not oil, it's prayer. It's the prayer of the righteous, the prayer of faith mentioned in verse 15. That's the main event in this text. So what about Mount Zion? How would this be applicable in the context of this faith family? How, how would Eric and I try to be faithful to this text if someone in our faith family calls and says, we're, we're sick, we're suffering, we're going through a difficult trial, and we need you to come here and pray with us? We would love to. It would be an honor. We're commissioned to do just that. We would love to minister to you in your suffering. And likely, because of this text, would be wise for us to ask you, brother, sister, do you know of any unconfessed sin in your life? Is there anything? Could this be something, an affliction that God is using to open your eyes? Could it be? You know, if you'd like for us to, we can use oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit because we know by faith that God is able to heal. There's no doubt whatsoever. We'll definitely pray for your healing with the understanding that it may or it may not be God's desire to heal you. And if God heals you, it wasn't the oil. It wasn't your magnificent pastors. It wasn't that at all. It was God and God alone. But he moves on from there. And he doesn't just stop with the importance of having the elders come and pray, lay hands on you, anoint you with oil, anything like that. Look at verse 16. He says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Now, when you and I confess our sins to one another, it encourages some things. It encourages spiritual health. It encourages confidence not only in one another and the love that, and the concern that we have for one another. It grows our confidence in the Lord and his ability to do whatever he wants to. And it shows our brothers and sisters in Christ that we're, we're serious 
about killing sin. If there is any sin in my life that's causing me this, this sickness, I, I, I want to be more than just healed from this physical uh, affirmity. I want to be, I want to be cleansed spiritually so that I can be healed from the sickness and so that I may better and clo- more closely walk with Christ. That would be the whole point. I love what commentator Douglas Moo had to say on this verse. He says, since the prayer of healing offered in faith accomplishes so much, and since God is anxious to forgive the sins of his people, the whole community should be encouraged to confess their sins to one another and pray for one another. By doing so, the health of the community will be ensured. Church, the prayer and the faith of the righteous has great power. Or your version may say, the prayer of a righteous person availeth much. And that is so true. And if that's been practiced in your life, and I know for some of you it has because I get a lot of nods as I'm saying things. And I know by a lot of nods that that's just affirmation that some of you have tried and tested this and found it to be true. But if you haven't, and there's suffering, or there's a trial, there's adversity in your life, but whether you think it's great or small, I encourage you to try the Scriptures, test the Scriptures, and you will be proven that it is right. In the final two verses, James gives us a great example of such faith, leading to our third and final point. So number three, the example of Elijah. The example of Elijah found in 17 and 18. Elijah Now, it's important probably to go back and study the life of Elijah a little bit more. I I was I learned a little bit more about Elijah this week than than what I've known before. And it made a lot more sense why James uses him as an example in this text. Elijah was highly regarded by the Jewish people that many looked to him as some sort of a superhuman man. He was like a super believer in their eyes. So when they're first reading through James's epistle or hearing these words uh, from James maybe being read to them, and they hear the word, uh, the name Elijah, they perk up, right? They're like, oh, he's talking about Elijah. Shh, listen, listen. Hush, kids, listen, he's talking about Elijah. You know, it's one of those, they didn't want to miss a moment of it because of who they was talking about. This is why James uses him in that example. So Elijah... He goes on to say, he wanted to make them understand this. You put Elijah up on a pedestal, and it's okay for you to acknowledge him, what God's done through him. It's okay for him to be maybe a hero in the faith to you, but look what he says. Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. He's saying, church, he was just like us, and the reason that we hold him in high regard is the fact that he was way more disciplined and committed than we are in certain areas. But we can also reach that kind of faithfulness, James would tell them, especially in the area of our weak and insignificant prayer life. We can be better than what we are. Look to the example of Elijah. Don't put him up on a pedestal and certainly don't worship him. But look at him as an example. And think about what we know about Elijah just by what this text tells us. First, we know Elijah was a fervent prayer, a passionate prayer. He prayed, the Bible says, that it might not rain for three years and six months. And I've felt like it's been that way sometimes in the summer in Alabama, but not even close. Could you imagine three years and six months and it did not rain on the earth? He prayed again and the rain came back. This doesn't mean that God was at Elijah's beck and call. This doesn't mean that when Elijah woke up each morning, God said, what can I do for you today, Elijah? No, 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 no. It didn't work that way at all. This doesn't mean that God is at our beck and call in it. All that we have to do is muster up enough unction or or whatever you want to call it to ask properly. What Elijah prayed, whether he had just said it softly or whether he had said it in an affirming way like he did, what Elijah prayed was in accordance to the will of God. That's what mattered. Even if it wasn't Elijah, you know, if, if, if God wouldn't have granted Elijah's prayer, If God wouldn't have answered yes to the prayer of Elijah, it would have still been beneficial to Elijah. He would have grown in the midst of that prayer. 
showing that it was his true allegiance and, and his true uh, reliance was on God and not himself. And that was what was so, you know, I think a lot of times people get wrapped up when they see God answer the prayer of someone like Elijah. And they say, man, his prayer life, man, man, I need to get like that so God answers my prayers right. Uh, God, give me that Corvette. You know, that sounds silly, but do you realize there are people out there that believe that garbage? I'm just not praying hard enough. I just don't have enough faith. If God wanted you to have a Corvette, if it's according to his will, you'd have three sitting out in the driveway. Stop fretting on those things. Think of another example that uh, the scripture gives us where somebody's praying fervently. Hannah. Hannah's a wonderful example. Hannah was pleading with God to give her a child. So much to the point to where the people around her thought she was drunk. They were like, this, this lady's on the sauce. And it wasn't that at all. She could hear their murmuring about them, and, and she knew of their accusations. I mean, she's drunk. Hannah responded this way, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I've, I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. See, it wasn't about an answered prayer as much as it was the total dependence, the total reliance upon God and the desire for his will in their life. If God had done such a transformation in the life of Hannah and had not given her a child, do you think she still would have praised his name? Absolutely. In the life of believers today, God may not give us exactly what we want when we ask for it. He answers our prayers in three different ways, yes, no, or wait, right? And so don't assume that because God don't answer a fervent prayer of yours that he's just not listening or he just doesn't care. Because there are many of you that have probably prayed fervently in a time of desperation. You think about what he's talking about here. He's talking about suffering. How many of you have been in the midst of suffering and have prayed more fervently, more passionately than you ever have before, and God didn't answer that prayer the way that you wanted him to. It happens sometimes. It does happen sometimes because we, we want that to be the will of God. But if you're faithfully following the Lord, even in those instances where you've prayed fervently, you probably learned that even if your prayer wasn't answered the way that you wanted it to be, that energy and that passion was present in that time. And there was still a sweet communion between you and the Lord, even though he didn't answer it the way that you wanted him to. I've heard testimony of people fervently praying as a loved one was passing away. God, don't let them die. God, please heal them. Please don't let them leave me. And in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of that calamity, you might not have seen or understood the will of God in that moment. But later on down the road, if we're allowed to see the will of God take place, and we're able to step back and see things from a 10,000-foot view, it's then we're able to say, oh, that's what you were doing. That's what you had planned. God, I, I couldn't understand it. I didn't understand it in the beginning, and I see it now. Even if it still hurts, even if it still hurts, even if you, you've been able to see the will of God play out in that suffering, but it still hurts. What a great comfort from the comforter, from our gracious Lord, to be able to acknowledge, here's my plan. Here's my plan. And let me say this, church, this side of glory, you may not ever be able to understand or fully see, fully comprehend the will of God for the things that you pled with him for but one day it will be worth it it will be worth it and he is always worthy in conclusion this morning i want to ask you if you would to stand a lot of things that we've looked at this morning i, I don't this is not one of those texts that bounces back and forth i'm not 
saying that, but a lot of things that we could, this could have been a lot longer message, I'll just say that, and I know many of you are thinking, amen, thankfully it wasn't, but think about the things we can pull from this text that, that God's trying to teach us this morning. We, first of all, I think we need to be a praying church, first and foremost. We need to be a confessing church. Prayer is an easy thing to do when we're reminded of it, especially or if we make that an important practice of our life. We can pray in public. We can pray in private. To be a confessing Christian can be a little bit more difficult, especially with certain sins. It's just, it humiliates us. And, 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 I, and, and I know that we wrestle with the fact that how can I be saved and have these thoughts? How can I be saved and still be tempted this way? Find comfort in the fact that you hate that. Find comfort in the fact that you are so sensitive to that sin or that temptation to sin that it hurts you, that it, that it crushes you. But don't hold that to yourself. Find a trusted brother or sister of the same sex that you know will carry that burden with you. Has the Holy Spirit convicted you today that you need to be confessing sin to others who will not gossip about you, but will come alongside you in this difficult walk. In church, yes, we must be practicing a fervent prayer life. Powerful prayer comes by means of passion and purity. Are you passionate about the things of God? Are you passionate about the Word of God? Are you striving for purity in your life? You pursue those two things, and I can promise you that your prayers will be fervent like Elijah. Your prayers will be fervent like Hannah. And to the lost person that may be with us today, I want to encourage you to fervently, compassionately cry out to Jesus and ask him to forgive you of your sin and to save you. The Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sin, all of it, and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. You don't have to cleanse yourself any at all. You don't have to become some moralistic hero and well, I need to quit doing this first I need to quit doing it no stop that nonsense and come to Christ today today is the day of salvation plead with him to save you I love you and I thank you for being here today I thank you for your attentiveness and your your affirmation as I preach I really do it's, it means a lot and I'd like to ask you to dismiss with me today uh, by singing the doxology Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Chad, would you just miss?